Hey everyone, this is Carrie Barnhart, and I am doing my lecture series on meat processing. So this is lecture one out of two, and this is for advanced meat science in the spring of 2017. So for this first lecture, we are going to begin with fresh cuts. Now most of us should know most of the cuts of the animals, but I'm going to review all of them, all of them just in case. And I'm only going to focus on the three major types of meat that's processed here in the U.S. just for time constraints. Um, so we're only going to look at beef, pork, and chicken. Now a few things here and there I'm going to throw in um, turkey and, and fish, but for the most part we're only going to cover the beef, pork, and chicken of fresh cuts. And then after that we're going to look at processed meats, the history and the type of processed meats that are out on the market. Once the animal is slaughtered and the carcass is ready to be processed, this is where fresh cuts begin. Now the carcass is cut down into different parts, which we will go over here in a minute, and these are typically the most valuable cuts of the animal. Now the cuts will be sold to stores and the reason I'm going over fresh cuts is because then once they are purchased then we typically process that meat in some way either by marinating, grilling, smoking, making something out of it that is technically a processed meat. So I felt that it was important to cover the fresh cuts even though we should know most of these it's always a great review to go over. Now we all know that different cuts of meat vary in tenderness, so it's also important to know how to prepare these cuts of meat so that they taste their absolute best. These 10 sections are the primal cuts of beef. Um, as we all know, a beef cow is very large, so some restaurants and the grocery store um, market type places don't have the facilities available to go ahead and process an entire animal. Um, so some slaughtering houses will go ahead and cut the cows down to primal cuts and then those primal cuts will be shipped to those smaller processing areas to be turned into retail cuts. Now the retail cuts, which I'll go over in a second, um, they do vary in tenderness. Now the less tender cuts need to be cooked a little bit differently just so they're more palatable while eating. Um, so it's recommended that they be braised or stewed. The medium tender cuts, they need to be cooked in moist heat. Now moist heat cooking methods can include poaching, simmering, boiling, braising, stewing, pot roasting, or even steaming. Um, now the tender cuts, they can be cooked in a variety of ways, roasted, rolled, fried, grilled, whatever. Um, so those are typically your higher dollar steaks, I guess you could say. So once we have the animal cut down into the primal cuts, then those primal cuts can be cut down into the retail cuts. Now I listed only six of the primal cuts here, the chuck, the rib, the short loin, the sirloin, the rump, and the round. Um, just because these are the ones that are usually cut into retail sections, some of the other Primal cuts like brisket are um, either left whole or they are cut down into smaller chunks to be used as stewed meats. Um, they are typically your tougher cuts, so they have to be cooked differently, and generally people aren't going to purchase them just to throw them on the grill or, um, or to uh, just cook them a, a way that you would maybe a steak. So um, they aren't as near as important in the retail category, but they, they still are significant, but I just don't want to list them out here. So um, here are the different retail cuts. You should recognize several of these, but just in case you don't, now you know where they come from. Um, the most tender areas are going to be your short loin, the rib, the sirloin. Uh, those are where your major steaks are coming from. So your rib eyes, your T-bones, your filet mignon, um, all the way to your sirloin steaks. And I think it's 
pretty interesting. Whenever you go to the grocery store, um, if you look at all these different cuts, I have seen more than once where they will put filet mignon next to the eye of round. And unless you know the difference between the two, you think you're getting a similar cut of meat. It's just going to be cheaper. But you will find out very quick that the eye of round is nowhere near as tender as the filet mignon, regardless of how you cook it. It's just not going to be the same. So cooking it is super important just because if you know the type of muscle that it's coming from, you know what you need to do to cook it to make it more palatable. I also wanted to mention that the sirloin is broken up into four different types of sirloin steaks. And those are just depending on where they are um, cut from the uh, from the muscle. Now, um, typically the pin bone sirloin steaks, they're named from the oval section um, of the ilium, which is the hip area of an animal. Um, the flat bone or the double bone sirloin steaks, they're named from the flat section of the wing of the ilium. Um, the round bone Sirloin steaks, those are named from the round sections of the slender shaft of the ilium. And lastly, the wedge bone sirloin steaks are named from the triangular cross section of the ilium. So again, just because you're getting a sirloin, um, they, there are four different areas that they may come from. They're all still very tender. Um, they all are still technically a high tender muscle area. Um, but that is why they may be shaped a little bit differently because they are different muscle sections coming out of the animal. For the pork fresh cuts, um, we've got a picture here showing one through six. Uh, the first one is the Boston butt. The second is the loin. The third is the leg. Fourth is the belly. Fifth is the picnic shoulder. And six is the jowl. The Boston butt and the picnic shoulder can be sold just how they are. They can be cut down into other cuts, but typically they are sold in the big sections. Um, other retail cuts for the loin are the rib chops, the center loin chops, and the tenderloin chops. Those also can just be left as whole cuts and be used in roast. The leg can be cut into the butt and roast or be cured into ham, which most of us knows um, that it can be into a whole ham or then sliced further down into country ham by different processing methods. The belly is where the spare ribs come from as well as the bacon. Um, now it is important to understand that Three-fourths of all pork consumed in the U.S. is processed. Ham, bacon, sausage, as an example, is consumed 78.6% of the time, whereas the fresh cuts of pork, the chops, the ribs, roasts, etc., is only consumed 21.5% of the time. So while the fresh cuts are important, the processed meats have more value into the U.S. industry. For the fresh cut poultry, um, we have six different cuts that are the most important on a chicken. Um, the breast meat, the drumstick, the thigh, the wing, the back, and the neck. The three highest profitable parts of a chicken, most of us know the first two, the breast and the wings. For obvious reasons, they are consumed the most um, just because of the higher qu quantity of breast meat and popularity and the easiness of eating wings. Um, but the third one is not listed as a typical poultry cut because it is the paws or the feet of the chicken. Now these are, well, they are in our grocery stores in this area. Uh, Every once in a while you can find them in Food Lion or other grocery stores, but they are typically shipped overseas to the Asian markets. Now, the most important grading for Paul's is grade A jumbo, and those bring the highest 
cost back to the producer um, if they are able to get paws that are big and do not have as many uh, ammonia burns or processing damage to them. And um, again, those bring back the highest amount of money. Okay, so now we've processed the carcass. We've got our retail cuts. We have purchased our meat and now we're taking it home to process it even further. So this is where we get um, different processing of fresh cuts that most of us do every day at home. Um, marinating meat, slow cooking it, adding spices, um, grilling, smoking, the list goes on and on. But cooking something correctly makes or breaks the end product. So, for example, one of my favorite cuts of meat is actually brisket. It is amazing, but I've had good brisket and I've had bad brisket. It's all about how it's cooked. Um, so, typically for steaks and roasts, that safe temperature, internal temperature, it needs to be 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Same for fish, 145. Now, for pork, it's higher. It's at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is the same for ground beef and anything with egg in it. Now, chicken breast as well as whole poultry need to be even higher, which is at 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, these temperatures are recommended to kill any type of bacteria that may be in the meat. Of course, you have some people that like their steaks rare. Um, the steak temperature listed is for a steak that is cooked to medium. Here is uh, a good summary showing the degree of steak doneness. Uh, to the far left, blue rare, which is pretty much the retail cut that is seared on either side, and it's still completely red. Um, rare is about 70%, or excuse me, 75% red throughout the center. Medium rare is seared on the outside with 50% red center. Medium is 25% pink on the inside. Medium well is just a little bit of pink on the inside. And well done is 100% uh, brown all throughout the meat. Um, now again, like I stated earlier with the brisket, it's all in how it's cooked. If it's not cooked correctly, then the taste may be different. Same thing with steaks. Uh, you have more flavor, more juiciness the uh, less cooking that it is done. Now I personally, I can't, I can't do rare. Uh, I just, it, I, I just can't do it. <laughs> my husband likes rare meat, but I can't do it. Um, whereas my mom on the flip side, she wants hers well done, pretty much burnt black. And you just ruin a good steak by doing that. No flavor whatsoever. Um, so while everybody does have their differences in what they like, um, pretty much sticking to medium, medium rare is, uh, I feel like is the most flavor that you can get in your steak, uh, without going too far with it still being cool in the center. Now, I also want to mention that the reason that you can eat steaks that may not be cooked entirely and other meats that may not be cooked entirely, um, is because the muscle um, is not exposed to any type of bacteria on the inside. The outside is cooked, so the bacteria that may be present um, usually is is eliminated. The internal muscle should not have any type of bacteria that is touching it, so you're able to not cook it um, as well done as other meats need to be um, that may have some bacteria risk. Now, this is why it drives me nuts whenever I go to a restaurant and they ask me if I want my hamburger or how I want my hamburger cooked. Um, hamburger is meat that has been grinded down. And so any of that bacteria, whether it's inside or outside of that hamburger, has the potential of being exposed to bacteria. So when you do eat a hamburger, it needs to be well done just to make sure that there's no risk of bacteria being on the inside of that burger. Um, so I, I'm sure to tell people that as much as I can because that is something that makes a difference between eating a steak that's rare versus a hamburger that is rare. 
So now that we've covered the fresh cuts of uh, pork, beef, and poultry, we're now going to jump into processed meats. I feel like there is a lot of negativity surrounding processed meats. Um, people think that it's been processed, so it has been touched so many times that it's not even real anymore. Um, I feel like that's the public perception, but that's not nearly the case. Um, Processed meats can be literally anything that is going from fresh cut to your table. So it's preparing it for human consumption. So it can be marinating, it can be grilling, adding spices, um, grinding it down into uh, the patty for hamburger. So it can be anything. It's very broad. Some of the ready-to-eat foods, a lot of people are against processed foods because of the ingredient list. Um, is so much longer than what I can make at home. And uh, the USDA does regulate ingredient lists that literally everything that goes into the product has to be labeled. And so, for example, meatloaf. What A meatloaf that you can buy in the store, it may have 20 ingredients, whereas what you make at home may only have five or six. So typically, our home recipe may say you know, one pound of hamburger meat, one bell pepper, one onion, a cup of breadcrumbs, an egg. Whereas in the store, when it's made, it has to be labeled um, with all those ingredients plus anything that's added, to, added in. So the breadcrumbs, for example, may have five different um, ingredients in it, so it has to be listed on the label. So that's kind of where the difference is if you do break it down to what you use at home and see all the different ingredients that are actually going into your meatloaf, it'll probably be just as long as what you can buy in the store. So um, I did want to mention that because there are some folks that don't like processed meats. They think they're, they're worse for you just because they have a bunch of extra things in them, but that's not necessarily the case. So processed meats have been around for a long time. Um, in the biblical and all the way to the modern day, they have been a big impact on preserving meats and coming up with methods where there wasn't any type of refrigeration. They were able to store this meat so that it could be used for weeks on end. Different methods are um, salting all the way to smoking or curing the meat. And many of these practices, again, have been around for a long time. It's just now, with science and re research, they're able to perfect these recipes and um, have meat in the store that is easier for us to consume without having to cure it ourselves or salt it ourselves or smoke it ourselves. Of course, like we just covered with the retail cuts, we can still process it a little bit differently um, if we choose, but there are a lot of processed meats in the store that just make it easier on us. So one area of processed meats is ready to cook. These are meats that have been chopped down um, or grinded um, and then mixed with, sometimes they can be mixed with the different spices or um, other binding materials and then are preformed into ready to cook uh, meat sources. So some examples include hamburgers, which we all know of the frozen patties that you can buy, um, or even the fresh patties that they now have at grocery stores that are ready to go ahead and be cooked. Um, the breakfast sausages, um, those are raw and just in the sausage casing and you literally just put them on the frying pan and, and cook them up really quick. Um, kielbasa is a Polish sausage. Um, again, it is raw. It's just in the casing and ready to be cooked. And then Italian pork sausage is another example of ready to cook meats. The next category of processed meats is ready to eat. These are products that have been, um, again, grinded and mixed with other spices, seasonings, and um, put into a, either a sausage casing um, and then cooked and then sliced, ready to go out into the grocery stores. They do not need to be heated to be eaten. Um, you can eat it raw. 
but for example, hot dogs are the first one on the list, and um, I have yet to have seen anybody who just eats a cold hot dog right out of the container. Um, now, on the flip side is Viena sausages, which are similar to hot dogs, and they are canned. You can most people I feel like eat those cold, but just a traditional hot dog. Usually, you roast them over a fire or bowl them and serve them warm. Um, pepperoni. That I feel like in the U.S. it's most famous just on pizza, so it is served warm as well. And, of course, you have salami. Um, and then other luncheon meats like deli, ham, turkey, roast beef. Um, the sauce is a is a uh, jellied type meat loaf, I guess you could say, and then it's sliced. And you can eat it on um, sandwiches as well and, and bologna. Um, those are pre-made into loaves, and they have other... It's used uh, trimmings as the meat source. Um, a lot of people say, oh, it's got, um, you know, any of the, the nasty parts, the, the head or um, the anus. The, that's what a hot dog is made out of. That's why I'm not eating it. No, it's, it's just with the trimmings. from After the animal, the primal cuts are cut and are taken off, then they use those trimmings and grind those down and put those into the meat sources. Um, and then they form it into a loaf. They go ahead and put like a casing on it and then slice it. So the ham, the turkey, it is made with meat in it. Um, and then it's thinly sliced in uh, from the loaf source. So these are all examples of ready to eat. But we do have people who do go ahead and warm them up. Um, there is the issue, while they are rel relatively safe, uh, listeria bacteria could be on some of these products, which is why people that are pregnant um, are recommended not to eat any type of deli meats or hot dogs, pepperoni, etc. Um, of course, you can eat it. It just does need to be warmed prior to eating. Next is cured. This includes um, salting, smoking, fermenting, any way that it is changed um, as additives in it, then it is in the cured section. So examples of this is bacon, which we all know there's low sodium bacon, um, hickory smoked, there's tons and tons of different flavors of bacon. And the one thing about bacon is it does hold a lot of its flavoring, where other meats it's not as um, noticeable if these different flavorings are added onto the meats. And then, of course, you have ham, which can be cured multiple different ways. So you have your uh, breakfast ham, and then you have, uh, like, your dinner ham, um, and those are smoked. Uh, they can be honey-cured, um, different flavorings for them as well. Then you have pastrami, pepperoni, chorizo. Um, of course, the pepperoni, we had it listed at, the, at our last Category 2, is ready to eat. It can do several different things. Just because it's ready to eat doesn't mean it can't be cured. It's cured and ready to eat, so it goes in both categories. And then chorizo is a Mexican sausage. If you've gone to a restaurant, a Mexican restaurant before, they may have had chorizo on the menu. Um, and it is also a cured uh, meat product. Now, some of the curing, it relates back to the history that we discussed earlier. There's several people who still like to do cured meats just because it does take them back with their traditions. But as far as preservation goes, um, especially in the U.S., there's really no need to cure meats to preserve them. Um, but then again, if it wasn't for curing meats, then we wouldn't have bacon. So um, I think we can all say that we very much enjoy having an option of uh, curing meat. And um, in other countries where there's not refrigeration as much available, then it is still a staple to those cultures. The last category of processed meats I'm going to cover today is canned meats. Examples of these are Spam, Vienna sausages, corned beef hash, sloppy joe sauce, and of course any chicken, turkey, beef, or fish. Now these are um, great resources for people who would like to store up some protein for emergencies. 
Um, some people really like to have these in, in their cabinets just for cooking. If the recipe just calls for a little bit of chicken in it and they don't want to turn their oven on for <laughs> just one chicken breast, then a can of cooked chicken is very easy to pick up and add it to their meal. Um, there's a lot of different options of canned meat. Um, there are some deli type sandwich uh, meats that can be eaten. Um, there's tons of different varieties and flavoring. Again, it all goes back into using the meat trimmings and then they combine it with different flavorings and go ahead and, and cook it and have it canned and uh, it's pretty shelf stable. So that is the last one we're going to cover today on the different types of processed meats. Our next lecture, we are going to go over um, how each of these are formed and the research behind it and how it actually gets from slaughter to your table. Okay, so that is the end of Meat Processing Lecture 1. Here are some of my sources that I use throughout this PowerPoint, and I look forward to you guys joining me for Lecture 2.